Hi everyone, this is Lynn Beckner from the Manitou Springs Heritage Center. And we're here today to talk about the life of Professor Edwin Paget. He was the man that set an amazing record for climbing Pikes Peak 985 times. I'm here today with his daughter, Val Paget, and his granddaughter, Jill Van Boris. And I'd just like to ask a few questions so that we all get a better sense of who was the man, Professor Edwin Paget. And so Val, I'll start with you and ask you, what, what was a typical summer vacation like for you? Hi, yes, a, a very typical summer vacation for us was we would go to Manitou Springs, Colorado and Pikes Peak. In fact, we many times people call him Professor Pikes Peak Paget. It became synonymous with his name. During the school year, he taught at NC State University, taught debate and speech and uh, English as well. And so, and which he did, I think, so he could head west to Manitou. This was already ingrained in his way of thinking how summer should be because as a child, he and his brother and mother always came west on the train to, uh, to spend the summer. And he climbed Pikes Peak for the first time uh, in uh, 1919. So um, it, was not, it was not something new. It was already multi-generational. Um, for us, heading west was a not challenging thing. At first, we traveled by train because we owned no car. And my father chose not to drive. My mother bought a car when I was nine. And we did the long five-day grueling trip west wow. with the course. No air conditioning. And uh, she had to stop the car and make lunch and start a fire for coffee. And we would continue on. So it wasn't an easy trip to get there. But we were always terribly excited to be there. Um, my father, of course. Uh, at that point was climbing high Peak seriously. And uh, we'll let Jill talk about the third and fourth generations and coming to Manitou, a town that just doesn't change. It's always a treasure. Yeah, Jill, what's, what's your experience uh, on a typical summer vacation with your grandfather? Well, um... So for me, it was just always a magical time to go out there with my mom and we would join up with my grandfather and my grandmother would come with us or with him. And um, he'd already been out there already for a good part of the summer when we would get there and climbing Pikes Peak every other day. And, and uh, for me, it was a kid. I was just a kid running around Manitou Springs, going to the arcade and getting the saltwater taffy at Patsy's oh. and you know, playing in the creek um, along through the town and climbing in the mountains along there. So Garden of the Gods was like a playground for me. So it was really Manitou was my was my summer playground. OK, and of course, as we we uh, all mentioned, we've all climbed Pikes Peak. I climbed yes. it was six. I had climbed now Manitou at age three and then Cameron's Cone at age five. And then slowly throughout the season of going farther and farther up the peak, I finally made it to the top when I, when I was six years old and was there to get the donuts. Um, Jill and Dylan had had a similar experience there bringing in <laughs> the next two generations. Uh, I don't know that I would call that a similar experience, mom. I think that yours was a lot harder because you were six and I was a, an adult mom with a, with a, I guess, what if he's 15 year old son. Um, so we decided to make the trek up to Pike Speak for the first time um, on our own on the hundred year anniversary of his first climb. So in 2019, my son and I, Dylan, ascended the peak um, to the reward of donuts at the top, as always. We had already been up there at the top before, of course, and we'd done the, done the, um, the, oh, um, what's the, the line? Um, cog but we had not, the what? The cog railway. Yeah, but yeah, so we had, we had been up that, but we had not yet actually done the full climb. So we did that in honor of his, of his hundred year anniversary. And so that, 
completed the fourth generation of climbing Pikes Peak. Well, that's pretty special for your son. <laughs> yeah, it was. We, we brought some of his ashes up to the top to, to do at the top of the, of the mountain. So that was, that was pretty special as well. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'd like to ask a different question. You know, the media often represented your father and your grandfather as eccentric because of all of the forward thinking ideas that he had. And I just would like to see how, how you would both respond to that. So Val, I'll start with you. Well, I think one thing that's important to remember is he was a debater. I won many awards in college and then taught debate and went all over the country with his debate teams, uh, doing very, you know, being very successful. And the thing about debating is you're trying to win the point. You're not trying to convince them personally for you, but rather for the idea. And I think that's important to remember. He had lots of ways to get the press to pay attention to him and including and not only written press and uh, but also the television uh, ABC did a special on him uh, but all of this was to try to convince people that they could do more that they could exercise and should do more exercise as they grew older so this was the, he was trying to win against in those days it, and which is now seems so long ago that people weren't running, they weren't exercising. Everybody was taking it easy as soon as they reached 60 uh, or sooner for sure. But he had discovered that he didn't want that to happen to him. It had started to happen and that's when he realized he must climb more. So naturally he picked Pikes Peak to sim symbolize that goal of staying in shape. And uh, so that's, that's what he was trying to sell through his many ideas. Yeah, did Jill, do you feel the same way that he wasn't really eccentric so much as he was passionate? Um, well, I mean, I would say that it definitely comes across as eccentric. I mean, any person that climbs a 14,115 <laughs> foot mountain 985 times probably qualifies as somewhat eccentric but his so as someone who is a communications consultant in my day job now the one thing that I I look back on and and all that he did whether it was creation of the the first baby olympics or you know some of these other amazing ideas he had or reaching out to every single president about how they needed to get some true cardiovascular exercise to open up the capillaries in their brains to make sure their brains didn't deteriorate. He was completely ahead of, of his time, but he also didn't look to monetize that. And I think as someone who works in the corporate space where that's something that you do when you're marketing an idea, um, I find that incredibly admirable and noble that he really just wanted to see Americans and the leaders of our country just become more fit and um, mentally able as they reach into their older years. And I think that was something that really mattered to him. So he wasn't selling the t-shirts, right? <laughs> <laughs> there were no t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There, yeah, no, no t-shirts. Okay, well, my final question is around what your father and your grandfather taught you about the way you live your life today. Val? Well, I think, I think it's not surprising that I, see, I do see what I want to do as something that there are no limits to. I mean, when you're, when you're three years old and know that you are going to kind of hate speak and I can tell you, then it looked even taller than it does now, which is pretty big. So uh, I, I, that he never he never questioned that I would be able to, but he provided me with the training to make me able to. I had to run up and down a hill back in North Carolina all winter. There was never a day off just because you didn't feel good. So uh, and it's part of the preparation. And then when we got there, we worked hard getting ready and getting acclimated, as I'm sure he would want me to say, 
don't try to do these climbs until you have done the training so that you are fit to really do it. Um, so I, I learned that there were no limits. And certainly in my case, my, my turn was to, to aviation, to set aviation records, which I did. And, um, and there's no limits of whether you are a, a girl or a boy, that topic never came up. So um, he certainly formed my life that way. That's uh, amazing forward thinking on his part. Uh, Jill, how has your grandfather influenced the way you live your life? So I, th I think the same thing with my mom, because we did, you know, we were, I was raised with him and he took care of me for a number of years when I was young. It was the same thing. I don't think there was ever a differentiation, whether I was a girl or a boy, but that just, it was important to, you know, always be physically fit. And for, for me, it manifested into mountain biking, um, which, you know, same thing I, I, I still do now and avidly. And, and um, I think about him often as I'm riding my bike up hills that you know he would run up and and just that just never quit spirit you know um there's certainly times when you get tired and you don't want to but you just keep going and and I think that was something that he instilled in us was to just always be fit you know to stay active and you know I think that's carried forward well great I, and I thank you both for coming out today and giving us a better idea of who Professor Padgett was. Any final thoughts? No? You know, I, I just wanna say that, I, I mean, I, for me, it was such a, it's such a great frustration now as someone, again, who does this for a living, who works in the communications field to see how amazing his ideas were and are, and whether it's baby Olympics or, cardiovascular health or lights on, on buildings. These are all things that, that he thought of back before they were a thought. And um, that forward thinking, I think, put him in the eccentric category. And I, he was just a man ahead of his time. All right, well, I thank you both for being with us today and uh, have a nice weekend. <laughs> Thanks, you too. Bye -bye.